Okay, since it's one o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys all for joining us today. Um, and good afternoon and welcome to this week's installment of the Huron Pines Connecting to Nature series. We're really excited to spend the next 30 minutes learning with you. Here at Huron Pines, we work to conserve and enhance Northern Michigan's natural resources, focused in three primary program areas, healthy water, protected places, and vibrant communities, our staff implement projects from river restoration and green infrastructure to protecting special places forever and controlling invasive species populations. If you're not familiar with our work, we encourage you to get to know us. I'm Jen Clem, Huron Pines AmeriCorps, serving at Huron Pines as part of my VISTA service through Michigan Tech, where I'm pursuing my master's in applied ecology. Abigail Urtel of Huron Pines will be leading an awesome conversation today. And before we swoop into that, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Please make use of the chat box to respond to questions, which you'll see them bolded on the slides, or to ask questions of your own today. We'll also have time set aside at the end for a full Q&A. We'll also be using the polling function today where you'll see a pop-up box to respond to. And if you do experience any te technical difficulties, Chris Ingle, our communications associate, is available in the chat by email or phone. We will also be recording this installment, so if you lose connection, you can watch later. And finally, I want to acknowledge the incredible funders who support the Huron Pines Education Program, the Great Lakes Fishery Trust, Consumers Energy Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities through the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Program, the Herbert and Grace Dow Foundation, and individual donors and supporters like you. And with that, I'm going to let Abby introduce herself, and then we'll swoop into this week's topic. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Jen. I'm really excited to be here today and talking about birds as part of our Connecting to Nature series. Um, I'm going to add my own disclaimer. Um, I am not a birder or a bird expert. Uh, I don't plan to be talking heavy details on bird identification or ornithology. My, my hope is that I can bolster my skills around that in retirement. Um, but I do love birds. I'm drawn to them, uh, both in my yard, but also in art and literature and culture. Um, and through my work as the community program lead with Huron Pines, I've really been uh, given this space to listen to folks about how they connect to birds or how they're interested in trying to connect to birds. And what I've seen is that this interest can lead to um, next steps in understanding the larger habitat or wanting to take some action to um, do good things for that larger habitat. So that's what we'll be talking about today, uh, talking about what birds maybe are in your yard, um, some ways to attract some different birds or more birds of the same variety, and about how getting curious about birds can, can lead us to uh, protecting the forests and the waters and the uh, open spaces that are around our own yards. Well, that's awesome. Um, and a lot of things to cover. So where are we gonna be starting? <laughs> Right, it's a big topic and there's also just a lot of birds. Um, there's about 10,000 species of birds in the world, uh, 2,000 species in North America and about 450 species in Michigan alone. So um, one of the things that we can do to start to narrow that number down a little bit is uh, think about simple groupings of birds. And so we've got a couple uh, up here on the screen. Um, the first being woodpeckers, that's one of my favorite groupings. And so that's that's one grouping that you can think about with the red-headed woodpecker as an example. Uh, we also have waterfowl, um, which are your ducks, uh, your geese, your common loons, uh, which we have here and we see in Michigan. Um, we can also think about raptors, which are your hawks and your eagles. Um, and just because it's fun to say, uh, we have our chicken-like birds which are our grouse, uh, woodcock, wild turkey, are, are really famous and fun game species that uh, lots of folks look for here in Northeast Michigan. The other thing that sort of breaking down into simple groups allows us to do is understand some of the adaptations that these groups have or changes that they've undergone over time to be able to fare better in their environment. Um, so if we look at the osprey, it's got very strong, big talons to be and strong uh, wings to be able to, to swoop down and grab large prey. Um, 
if we think about woodpeckers, they've got that big, thick, long bill to be able to break into uh, to trees and get the food that they need. Um, and our waterfowl, they look pretty awkward uh, on land, but they've got a great body type when paired with uh, webbed feet to, to do just, just great things in the water. So, um, so that helps us start to understand different types of birds and where birds might be on the landscape. Um, and we have a poll question here for folks if they wouldn't mind participating. We're curious how many different types of birds you've seen in your yard. Yeah, and, and that's great. I know I see a lot of songbirds, but I think that's just because my neighbors attract them. But mm -hmm. well, it's, it's the largest kind of simple grouping too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we're actually seeing quite a few so far. Some Someone has 20 plus birds that they've wow. seen in their yard. Um, 10 to 20 and 5 to 10 are kind of battling for dominance right now, evening out. <laughs> but um, And then if there are any particularly interesting birds you guys have been seeing, feel free to chat those in. I know it's always cool to hear what people have actually been seeing. Yeah. All right, so it looks like a, a split between 5 to 10 and 10 to 20. Cool. So yeah, um, bird activity. <laughs> yeah. So um, we know we have all these different types of birds. How how do we know like if they're actually enjoying themselves, right? Um, that is a great question. Um, it, it's imp it's important to uh, think about, you know, what it is that birds need to be happy if we're going to be able to understand them and see them. Um, and it's sort of similar to what we need to be happy, right? When I think about my kids, they're happiest when they've got a, a lawn to run around in or space to run around in and jump, jump and play, um, when they've got a cozy bed to curl up in the evening when they're tired, though they swear to me they're never tired. Um, and, you know, a, a fridge and pantry stacked with their favorite snacks and maybe the occasional veggie. Uh, it's the same for my chickens, my backyard chickens. They've got a, you know, a nice house there and food and water, so they're, they're pretty content. Um, and if we look at sort of other birds that are in our area and looking at um, the Kirtland's warbler as a specific example, it's on its way back and hopefully we'll see it soon. It likes a nice big patch of forest, um, usually about 80 acres minimum. Um, it likes uh, trees that are close together and have branches that are low because it's a ground nester, so it likes that shelter um, that the branches provide. Um, and it likes lots of bugs that you can find uh, in amongst those pines. And then later on in the year when they're getting to migrate or starting to think about migrating, they, they eat blueberries that are also found uh, in that jack pine forest landscape. So birds are happy when they have adequate space, uh, adequate shelter, and adequate food supply, uh, which are the three components of habitat or the natural environment that any organism, ourselves, birds, other wildlife uh, need to live and grow. So we might think we're providing all of these three things, right? Space, shelter, and food in our yard, but we're still not sure if, if birds are liking it. And so we need to understand what birds might be doing to tell us if they're happy. And again, we can look to ourselves. We have certain verbal and nonverbal ways of indicating happiness, and that might be um, sitting quietly and relaxed, our shoulders are down, uh, we're breathing easily, uh, we might smile to show people that we're happy, we might do something that we love to do. I love to read, so oftentimes that's an indication to my family that I'm happy. Uh, and I might nod off and go to sleep if I'm feeling content and safe, uh, and those types of things. Get up and reread the paragraph I was reading before. Um, or if I'm really happy and I want to really show it, I might sing or hum, I might say cheese, big cheese for the camera when I'm feeling good, um, or puff my chest up and feel very proud like our friend the Kirtland's Warbler here who's singing, which is a way that a, a bird can show that, that they're happy. Um, birds might preen or clean themselves. If you have a bird bath, they might, they might have a bath and show that they're, they're content. They might build a nest using grasses and pine needles, pet hair in your yard. All of these things that generally um, show that they're content and happy and have the things that they need in your backyard. 
So we have another uh, question here. This is one to, to uh, pop into the chat box. Um, and we're curious what types of bird behavior um, people in the audience are seeing in their yard. Um, and while, while folks are doing that, while they're thinking about the different bird behavior and sharing, one of the new experiences that I had in my own backyard a couple of weeks ago was the flicker dance. I had, I had no idea that this was a thing. Uh, and we had three northern flickers, two females and a male, uh, in our yard. The male was just eating, picking out worms and ants, because northern flicker is actually the most ants of any bird in North America, so he's eating away. And the two females were bobbing their heads, and they'd kind of stand back and stare at each other, and then they'd sidestep a little bit, a little bit, showing off the yellow on their uh, tail feathers. Um, and this was an indication that they really liked this space, and you know, one of them was gonna, one of them was gonna win the mail in order to start a, a family. Um, and so we we see them from time to time now, paired up uh, in our yard. And so it was a really interesting experience for me. It sounds like it, and it, it's interesting a, a flip. I think normally when we think of birds, we think of the men are always trying to attract the mates, but to have the females. Um, but in the chat, we have lots of lots of different things. So we have nest building, we have predation, we have feeding, um, lots of insect eating on the ground. I know the birds outside have been really happy with the rain and they've been eating all day too. Um, awesome, awesome. So we have these happy birds in our yards, but what about when they're not in our yards? Where, where are they? What are they doing? Right. We can't have all the birds in our yard all the time, right? 450 <laughs> different species of birds in my yard probably wouldn't make me happy. Um, so that's a great question. Um, you know, we see chickadees, eastern bluebirds, robins, lots of different woodpeckers in our yard. But where are they when they're not in my yard? Or where are the other birds that should be around here? So we're going to zoom out a little bit now. Um, this is an aerial photo um, from our friends at Google of um, my house, which is in the pink circle. Um, and if you zoom out a little bit, you start to see some different landscape features that are, are um, important um, for understanding what's around my yard. So um, we have the, the Asaba River that's kind of curling through the neighborhood, and then we start to see larger patches of, of forest and different types of tree cover. Um, when we think about that Kirtland's Warbler example from a little while ago, them needing 80 acres of land, uh, or habitat um, uh, to be content. Um, the same can be said of an eastern bluebird. Um, I see it in my yard, it perches on the power lines, um, but it likes two and a half acres at a minimum and, and more like seven acres to be content and happy. I don't have seven acres uh, in my yard, I wish I did. Um, most of us don't, some of us do, which is great. Um, but I know in looking at this that there are these pockets of protected forest land and um, larger patches of forest land or open land um, that these birds uh, can get what they need. They can get that space component that they need, even if I can't provide it in my backyard. If we zoom out even further, um, now the, the pink circle is around my neighborhood rather than just my, my own yard, we see some additional features. So I'm going to use my cursor here um, and hopefully folks can follow me. So if we go over here, we have um, some, some forest cover over here. These diamonds actually indicate managed Kirtland's warbler land. Um, so that is a, a human element, but still a large forest scape that they use. Um, this here is the, the Manistee River. And then of course we have the Asable, which we pointed out before. I don't have any water features in my yard, so I don't have the shelter, space, and food for water birds or um, birds that tend to be around water, but uh, I do get to see great blue herons every now and then or ospreys and bald eagles flying over my yard because these features are close by. Um, and then we have Hartwick Pines, which is a great state park and a great local amenity. Um, and it has uh, older trees, it doesn't have the younger trees that a Kirtland's warbler enjoys. I don't think I said that earlier, but they prefer younger trees. Whereas birds like Evening Grosbeak really like mature trees, much older, taller trees um, to build their nests in and to feel content and find the things that they need. Um, so 
by understanding sort of the habitat pieces around me, we see the, the different ages in trees that, that um, birds need and the different food sources that they like to have uh, and the different space needs that they have so that they can pop into my yard every now and then and then head out and find the things that they need around me. So how can, how can we start um, incorporating some of those things from those wild places, those natural features into our own yards? All right, yeah, let's step back into my yard here for a second. Um, so, and I'm gonna bring that information that I've learned by understanding sort of the larger habitat or landscape components. Um, so kind of going with that varied tree age uh, and height sort of uh, piece, uh, if you happen to have uh, some tree cover or forest edge on your property, um, you may see some older or dying trees. Rather than taking those completely down, you could leave them in a manner that's not dangerous to property or people, um, but it provides um, both uh, the variety and age of tree that different birds might be looking for. Uh, it also provides food source for things like woodpeckers who are looking for those insects that are, are inside um, the tree. And then it can also provide nesting habitat for cavity nesters like a chickadee or um, nuthatches or things like that when, when the woodpeckers are done and they leave those, those holes there. So that's something you can do um, when you're making some choices about tree removal or, or um, things like that. If you don't have trees or a forest edge, you can always build a nest box to provide some of that um, shelter component. Um, and this is a chickadee nesting box that we have here on our property that's been used the last couple of years. Um, and we will be sharing out plans for building um, this particular type of nesting box with the take home notes. So that is something um, that you can do. The other thing that you can do uh, in, in terms of sort of extending that natural habitat into your yard, because really it's just a puzzle piece, right? Your yard is a puzzle piece of a much bigger um, puzzle picture. And so one of the ways to bring more birds into your backyard is to really extend those habitat characteristics into your yard. And native plants is a great way to do that. Um, it's great for a lot of different reasons, pollinators, other wildlife, those types of things, but it's also great for insect production, which is what I want to talk about when we think about birds. And in particular, caterpillars. Um, we can see our common yellow throat here with a juicy <laughs> caterpillar in his beak. Caterpillars are really important for birds, and in particular, all those parent birds that are feeding their new, new young. Um, they're really rich in fat and high in protein, so they're a, they're a really good food source for birds when they, when they first hatch. A chickadee, for example, will feed close to 9,000 caterpillars to its young, yeah, from, uh, from the time they hatch to the time they fledge. So, so they're constantly looking for that, and they're not going very far afield. Uh, it's, sort of, it's known that they'll only go about 160 feet max, um, because they don't want to leave their young exposed, right? So they don't want to go too far for this food. So the idea of bringing some of those native plants that uh, connect back to your larger habitat types into your yard um, is a really great way to attract uh, more birds into your yard and have those, those food pieces. Um, some examples of native plants that you could use um, that are good for caterpillars as well as other insects are native goldenrod and native aster, which you can see here are some examples of that. Uh, native milkweed is one that most of us are familiar with for uh, monarch caterpillars and of course monarch butterfly population, uh, which is important. Native lupin, uh, sedges, which are a grass, and like I learned in my native plants course, sedges have edges, so if you run your hands up and down, you'll feel the edges, um, and blueberry. So those are all um, fairly easily accessed, fairly easily cared for um, types of native plants. And so thinking about converting some of your lawn uh, to these native plantings is um, a really great first step. So we've been talking a lot about happy birds. Um, does that mean happy people? Generally, yeah, it does. Um, you know, again, the idea of um, 
looking to birds to watch their behavior helps us sort of understand what's happening in our environment. Um, birds are considered an indicator species. So not only are they indicating to you what maybe the larger habitat or landscape components are around you, um, but they can indicate whether your environment is healthy. Um, think about uh, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring and her work observing birds and what that told us about DT or the canary in a coal mine example where miners would take canaries down into the mine and if they died it was an indication that gas levels were rising um, to a place that was not healthy for humans. So if you're watching birds and you're seeing them generally in the same patterns, generally doing these activities that um, show contentment or happiness, they're showing up in generally the same numbers, this means that your surrounding habitat and landscape are strong and healthy. You're healthy, your community's healthy with clean water, clean air, you know, the forest space, uh, field space that we need to recreate. And then how can we apply this? Well, um, by taking the time to watch and understand the different birds in your yard and their behaviors, you're increasing that understanding of, your, of the larger habitat around you, um, which is important for understanding how things might change or how um, things could be strengthened. And then by taking some of these small actions to make your yard an extension of that larger habitat, um, you can attract more birds, but you can also strengthen or help protect these special natural systems that we all really value here in uh, Northeast Michigan. A few tangible next steps to, to do that application. Start watching and listening if you're not already. Um, and then get curious. Start asking about where that bird might go or why it's doing a certain thing or if it's, if it's missing something. Um, you can zoom out to understand those habitat types around you and then be able to make your yard an extension of that. Try planting one native tree or plant or shrub um, or, or even a small space in your lawn. Um, avoid mowing any wildflowers and native grasses that are just coming up on their own. You can also leave seed heads on things like coneflowers or berries on uh, native dogwood to provide food for our winter resident birds, the birds that stay around all year. Um, and then work to eliminate pesticide use, which is generally good for wildlife as a whole, but certainly when we go back to that insect importance for birds and bird survival um, can have, a, have an impact if we're using pesticides. So we're curious to know uh, which action um, our audience, our participants are most excited about potentially trying. Those are all great ways to actually apply it. I know since I've been at home, right, with a window right in front of me, I've been able to actually watch the birds a little more closely mm -hmm. and actually start getting to know the local species. So those blue jays and starlings and uh, grackles, like Josh was saying earlier in the chat, um, it, it's really great to even just see them just for mental health. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing um, native planting and less mowing and no pesticides are great, great mm -hmm. choices to apply. Yeah, less mowing. It's interesting. I love mowing my lawn. I love the satisfaction of being able to do it and see my progress. Um, but I also recognize that I don't need to mow that much all the time and it would be nice to take a break. So, yeah. Um, so we have an activity to help folks um, start to uh, do a little bit more bird observation and learning uh, in their backyard. Um, and our um, sort of prompt is to use a bird guide to make a list of birds that can be found in your area. Now, most bird guides are pretty comprehensive and they'll have birds from places that maybe aren't exactly right here in Northeast Michigan. Um, but you can read about their colors, their markings, their behavior, their movement patterns and get a sense of uh, which birds um, you, you might see in your neighborhood or in your backyard. So it's good to kind of make a list of those. And then once you have them, let's play bird bingo. Um, you know, make some bingo cards with the different birds that you might see. And next time you're out with your family in your yard or taking a walk uh, according to, you know, current travel guidelines and social distancing, uh, keeping that in mind, you can play bird bingo and see what you see and, and where it might be. 
And a couple of examples of field guides that I have that I really like um, are these ones. So this is the Crossley ID guide, which is actually really great because he shows the birds in their habitat types. So you can actually kind of double up your learning a little bit with, with this guide. And so that's our redheaded redheaded woodpecker there. Um, and then also um, sort of more traditional, well not traditional, but um, sort of your stereotypical bird guides like Sibley's. Um, this will give you uh, sort of the different, the male, female, um, what they might look like if they're only a year old versus being more mature, that type of thing. So these are good guides. If you don't have bird guides, it's okay because you can access this information online. Um, Chris is going to put in the chat box a link to eBirds Exploring Regions page where you can type in, like I would type in Crawford County, Michigan, and then it gives me a list of birds that should be or have been seen in my area, and you can look at them that way. Or you can use Merlin, both the, the app for your smartphone, um, or there's an online, you can access it just online too. So we'll be sending that information in those links home in the take home packet, but Chris is gonna put the eBird one here in the chat. Yep, and um, as Samuel pointed out too, you don't have to just use words when you're doing the bingo and the bird bingo, you can use pictures, which is a great way to include kiddos. Um, and also to do it social distancing, you know, if you make up the, the bird bingos and then, you know, send them out to different people, you guys can all go out on your separate hikes and be collecting too. That's a great idea. I love that. Yeah. And bird guides are actually really great for getting um, kids of all ages interested in reading too, um, because they're so visual and then um, kids are interested in learning more about, you know, reading more about what's in there. So lots of applications. And that's great. I know I can't wait. Um, in, in the take home notes, we will have the uh, a, a sample bird bingo for you guys as well as well as the normal take home notes that Chris will be sending out. Um, but that is the um, the end of today's content. If you guys are looking for other ways to get outside, be sure to check out the Stay Connected to Nature page at hereonpines.org. And we appreciate everyone for joining us. Um, I have a few wrap up items and then we'll have time for questions. So as a part of our efforts to understand how we can continue to improve education programming, we'd appreciate a couple minutes of your time to fill out an evaluation survey at the conclusion of this, which Chris has put the link in the chat box for you. Uh, we also have an overview document that highlights the primary information covered today, which are the take home notes as well as some additional resources and will be sent to all who pre-registered with Chris. If you didn't pre-register, don't worry about it. Um, just email Chris at chris at huronpines.org and he'll get you all that information. And then join us next Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, and we'll be talking about how to read rivers with Josh Leeson. And all right, so let's dive into some of these questions. Um, yeah, so there's one, uh, why do all the birds leave right after they take the feeders in? That seems to. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, my guess or my gut tells me that um, they get used to having a feeder. You know, it's, um, it's sort of a, they, they know it's there, they get sort of habituated to it being there. And it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just something that happens. And then um, when that really obvious food source goes away, maybe they know that your neighbor has a feeder <laughs> or, um, or they just, you know, they're looking for, for food elsewhere in that, in that um, sense. I will say that it is good to take your feeders in at night um, because attracting birds to your yard also attracts other wildlife. Um, and in particular, uh, bears really like feeders. Um, so it's good to just get in the habit of bringing those in at night. <laughs> it's a really good tip, unless, unless you want to see birds or bears, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, is there a risk of spreading non-native or invasive plants if you're feeding with bird seed? Mm. Yes. There is. So you do want to be careful about the type of seed um, that you're feeding, um, feeding birds. Um, it's also you need to be careful the type of plants that you're planting too, because that that translates. Um, so 
if you're planting a particular shrub that isn't native, um, isn't necessarily the best plant for your particular habitat or the landscape around you, um, birds can eat those berries or those seeds and then fly uh, and leave them, you know, in places um, where they'll just continue the spread of that. So it is good to understand, again, those larger habitat connections um, around your yard before, before just throwing any old seed out there. And then, do you know of any effective ways to keep squirrels and chipmunks from raiding bird feeders? I wish that I did. <laughs> um, squirrels are the most acrobatic animal I have ever seen in my entire life. Um, so I think uh, you can try all kinds of different things that are out there on the market, um, but it's, it's one of the liabilities of having uh, feeders out there. And I would welcome anyone who has a tip, a proven tip or strategy for that to share in the chat box because we certainly could use that. <laughs> we could use that, that tip here. Yeah, um, and it is 1.30, uh, so Abby and I can stay on the line for another 10 to 15 minutes to continue answering questions. But just to honor the 30 minute time slot, if you do need to jump off, we appreciate you joining us today and hope to see you next week when we talk about reading the rivers. Um, and we do have some extra videos too, if you guys are interested in continuing to learn about birds and bringing birds to your yard. Um, okay, and there is another question, will, birds, will all birds eat sunflower seeds? Do you know? All birds? No. Um, so again, it's sort of looking at those adaptations that we talked about several slides ago and the different sort of forms that a beak can take. So your seed eaters typically have really thick, um, strong bills, um, you know, like on a gross beak or um, on uh, sparrows and things like that. They're shorter, they're more powerful. Um, but if you think about a hummingbird um, that's looking for nectar uh, and things like that, they have that much longer, skinnier nose that allows them to get right down into, into the flower uh, and, and get that nectar. So no, not every bird is a, is a seed eater or will eat sunflower seeds. Interesting, yeah. So kind of keeping that morphology in mind, the way they look. Hmm. Yeah. Well, if there are any other questions, feel free to chat them in. Um, and what about non-natural predators like house cats? How are they kind of affecting our populations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, uh, good question. So the last thing we want to do is build this oasis in our yard <laughs> for birds and then uh, let either our own cats out or have a problem with um, you know, either feral or loose cats in the neighborhood. Um, they are uh, certainly a predator of birds. And so um, being careful about that, either in your own behaviors and the ways that you um, manage your pets is important. And if you have neighbors who um, have cats that are free or roaming and you want to have a conversation with them about it, it's a, it's a great way to just share some information. <laughs> um, so yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. If you guys want to sneak any in there real quick, but um, I think it, it's really great. Do you have any do you have any recommendations on bird seeds or mixtures or anything yourself, Abby? Um, we use black oil sunflower seed, and then we also have a thistle, which are the very small um, thin seeds for and uh, things like goldfinches and um, pine siskins, like the the thistle. Um, we really honestly have stepped back from feeders in our yard because we do we have some pretty active bears in our neighborhood and um, it's become a bit problematic which is you know it's disappointing um, but it's uh, it's a catalyst and a motivator for us to do some different things um, with the native plantings and nest boxes and leaving dead trees and that type of thing so kind of like a, a constant experiment then. yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we do have one, we have a, a hummingbird feeder on our window, um, which so far has been safe and we're hoping we'll be safe from birds. Um, that one I just enjoy because you get to see the hummingbird so up close, yeah. Very cool. Um, so since we're not getting any more questions coming in, I think that's the end of it for today. So thank you again, Abby, for presenting on that. And thank you to everyone who's joined in and who stayed on the line so long. Um, next week, we will be talking about how to read rivers. Um, so that should be another cool broadcast. And I'm excited to join you guys all again next week. So thank you. Yeah, thank you.